Ronnie. Good morning again. Good to see everybody. Let me uh, remind you folks at home that are watching this on video to stop this, get your lesson notes, have them available when the uh, lesson starts. And I want to read uh, an announcement to you that was given to us this morning. Beginning what, uh, Wednesday, August the 24th, join us by listening to and encouraging a young preacher in training. The Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary School of Theology, our church through them, the, our church has agreed to provide a safe training ground for new upcoming preachers. A different seminary student will preach each Wednesday evening. These students are enrolled in Dr. Chris Osborne's class. Dr. Osborne is our North Fort Worth campus teaching pastor. Come and see as you might uh, witness the next Charles Haddon Spurgeon. This will take place in room 110 at 6.30 on Wednesdays, and it'll be for 12 weeks. So any of you that are interested, that's Wednesdays at 6.30. Last Sunday, we had our annual leadership camp, and our class was well represented, and we had some really productive uh, discussions. One of the things that I needed to uh, just make everybody aware of that we agreed on is at this time, we are not considering or looking for a third teacher. All of the group leaders are doing a great job, and I encourage all of you to continue with that, and we as leadership appreciate what you're doing Lunch today, for those of you that are interested in going with the group, uh, Myra has told me you're going to eat at the Back 40 Barbecue. Is that correct? Okay, so any of you that are interested in that, you can join them at the Back 40 Barbecue, which is on Davis Boulevard at uh, Main Street on Smithfield. And let me tell you about some words of encouragement. The pastor of St. Paul's Church was ill one Sunday morning, so they had to call in a substitute to fill in. In his opening remarks, the substitute preacher said, you know, a substitute preacher is like a piece of cardboard in a broken window. He fills the space, but he's not real glass. After the service, a lady approached him, and she wanted to pay him a compliment, and she said, you weren't a piece of cardboard today. You were a real pain. <laughs> By the way, I hope you got rain today or this week. We got a little shower at our house, and I looked in the midst of the rainstorm in the backyard, and our, our little boy was out there, had, had, a, had a life jacket on. Of course, his legs are only about that long, but he had a life jacket on you. That's Yogi the Wonder Dog. We have people look at him, and they wonder what kind of dog he is. That's the reason he's a wonder dog. <clears throat> Speaking of rain, I was talking to Jimmy earlier, and you know they spent about 115 years out in Lubbock, and he was telling me that Lubbock got a little rain this week. And uh, he said one of the reasons they're rejoicing out there is because it had been so dry that, uh, oh, thank you very much. <laughs> the pause that refreshes. It's been so dry. <laughs> well, let me tell you how dry it was. It was so dry that the Presbyterians had started using washcloths on people for baptism, and uh, and the Methodist the Methodists had gone from sprinkling, you know, just kind of splash a little water, and the Baptists are using a vacuum cleaner on them. So it has been that dry out there in West Texas, and folks, that's dry. I want you to know. Well, today, gang, we are continuing our study in the book. Of 2 Kings. Last week, I'll tell you, old John, old John led us through the life of a king by the name of Joash. Do you remember how old Joash was when he became king? Seven. Was it seven or nine? Seven. seven? Okay, he grew two years into my memory. So, seven. He was seven years old when he became king. And he was kind of under the influence of the, the priest and every decision that he made. The, kind of, the priest helped him make that decision. And they went through a time when they, they made some good decisions and they made some bad decisions. And they found out that the influence, the, inf the power of influence was extremely, extremely important. I got to thinking about that, John. 
And over the years, I make, I make little notes of sayings, of truths, Bradfordisms, and all this business. And I copied down some things that I thought about that came to mind during your lesson last week. And here's one in working with young people many, many years ago, and it has been many, many years ago. If you're not part of the solution, then you're part of the problem. You ever thought about that? If you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. Secondly, not to decide is to decide. These are things that we used to share with our own kids, our own family. Kids, you've got to come to a place where it's important that you make a decision and stand on it. You know, a, a fish that, is, that has uh, expired, like a salmon, the thing, they don't have to make any decisions, but guess what? They just get swept downstream. And that's what happens when we don't make a decision. If you don't stand for something, you're going to fall for anything. And all that's required for evil to win is for good people to do nothing. And these are all things that it's important as we uh, make decisions. Well, this week we are moving on. Last week we were in, in 2 Kings, the 11th chapter. This week we are moving on to um, 2 Kings, the 17th chapter. But here are some things. Have you ever, and the reason I thought about this, I have a couple of relatives, believe it or not, that just get all over me. I mean, they get all over me because they feel like I'm so conservative. And, you know, I, because they say, listen, you're con God is love. All the stuff about having to come to a place where you accept the fact that if you don't have Jesus, in, that is such a conservative idea. That is so, you know, God is love. And at the end of the day, God loves all people. And so, kind. Of, have you ever heard anybody like that? I got a whole nest of them in relatives that they are just like that. They just want to gush on all the time. God is love, and He wouldn't dare send anybody to hell. Have you ever heard that? Well, you know what the truth is. The truth is, God doesn't send anybody to hell. Do you know that? God does not send anybody to hell. Those people have made their own decisions, speaking of making decisions, and they literally, uh, biblical truth, they choose, they, they send themselves in that direction. Well, our working passage today out of uh, 2 Kings is the fact that God judges. And so many, uh, again, people say, ah, God doesn't judge, he's a God of love. But today we're going to find out according to his word, you know, it's one thing for us to, uh, for us to kind of make quotes of what we feel in our heart. But it's, it's another thing to find out what God says and stand on what God says. And oftentimes what God says is a little bit counter to what we want to accept in our hearts. So today we're going to find out through this passage that God does judge. And we're going to look at that. But here's some things. You know, these past, uh, this past quarter, our focus has been both on 1 Kings and 2 Kings. And we have, we have walked through the story of the kings. We have found out, we have found out through our study of, of 1 and 2 Kings, uh, kings that the character and the lives of the kings of Israel and in Judah. Now, again, what I'm saying here, 1 and 2 Kings, if you don't watch it, you don't know which which tri which uh, which group you're talking about, the northern kingdom or the southern kingdom, because one chapter will have a focus on a, a king. Well, just like last week, this guy Joash, he was a he was a king, he was a king up in the northern kingdom, Israel, and before that we talked about uh, kings that were king down in the southern kingdom, and so we have been studying the character and the lives of the kings both of Israel and of Judah, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. We've also been studying about the cause of the calamities of these two nations. And by the way, you know, we've been studying it first and second kings. It's interesting 
about uh, a quarter and a half or two quarters ago, we studied the book of Daniel and uh, it was it Ezekiel? I think Daniel and Ezekiel. And these were written while uh, both Judah and Israel were in captivity. You remember they were in captivity for at least 70 years. We're going to find out that uh, one group was uh, in captivity a little more than 70 years. But we've been talking about the cause and the calamities of why the children of Israel and Judah ended up in bondage for at least 70 years. And then... In First and Second Kings, we're going to be, talk about the conclusion of their actions. What, what were their actions that brought about the conclusion of them being in captivity? And so that's what we've been talking about over these past uh, this past quarter. Here are some important. You know, I'm kind of big on I'm kind of big on history, and here are some things that I just kind of put in front of us today to consider because. What we've been talking about the last quarter, the last six months, really leading up to something. And we're going to find out what that's leading up to. Here are some important biblical dates. And all these important biblical dates are leading us to something. Number one, the nation of Israel. Now today we, we see the nation of Israel as a southern kingdom and a northern kingdom. But before they became divided, the nation of Israel, the Jewish people, they were established in about 1490 B.C. when they came out of bondage in Egypt. The nation of Israel, they, God really called them his own people after they crossed the Red Sea and were in, um, in, the, uh, in the, it was the desert land, wilderness, that's a word I couldn't think about. So they were established in about 1490 B.C. Well, Moses moves them 40 years later into the promised land, and that happened about 1450 B.C. Their first king was Saul. They went from about 1450 under the leadership of Joshua. You remember they started crying for a king. Oh, we need a king. Everybody, all of our neighbors, everybody has a king except us, and we don't have a king. You remember that? They said, oh, we need a king. Well, their first king, God finally relented, gave him the first king, and their first king was Saul. And he was established as king about 1450. Then the second king came along, and of course we know that was David, King David. And then their third king, and we've been studying about this guy in 970 B.C., oh, Solomon hit the forefront. And we, we did a lot of study about Solomon. Well, he became the third king of the nation of Israel in about 970. And then, lo and behold, in about 931, they get, they get uh, fractious with one another, and the, the nation of Israel, as it was then, they divide in about 931, right after Solomon died, and it fell into two kings, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. One was king of the northern tribe one was king of the southern tribe and so consequently they ended up looking kind of like this are we looking at a map we are that's good we're looking at a map brother john and you can see how the nation split into two different tribes the northern kingdom was called what israel the southern kingdom called how many tribes comprised the northern kingdom? Ten, Ten tribes. How many tribes can comprise the southern? <laughs> two. That's about, that's right. Probably At the end of the day, probably about one and a half. But two is close enough. And so consequently, we, we have been dealing with kings of these two nations, Israel and Judah. And so what we've been studying about for all these past weeks is how these kings brought their influence to bear. Well, today that brings us up. That brings us up to 2 Kings 17, and we're going to read 23 verses. So in your handout, <clears throat> I have put together in front of you those 23 verses. I'm going to read it aloud. I'm going to read it slow because this is the story of what happens in 2 Kings 17. So you, are you looking at your passage of scripture? And are we looking at the, there we are. Can you read it from that? 
I didn't think so. So let's read it from this. All right. You ready to read along as I read aloud? In the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah. Now, he's the king of Judah. Is that the southern or the northern kingdom? So that's right. Hoshea, son of Elah, became king of Israel. Is that southern kingdom or northern kingdom? Northern kingdom, that's right. So again, pointing out, first and second kings really dealt with the kings of the southern kingdom and the northern kingdom. So again, in the twelfth year of Ahaz, king of Judah, Hoshea, all the son of Elah, became the king of Israel. He ruled in Samaria for nine years. As far as God was concerned, he lived a bad life, but not nearly as bad as the kings who preceded him, who went before him. Then Shalabazer, king of Assyria, attacked. Hoshea was already a puppet of the Assyrian king and regularly sent him tribute. But Shalabazer discovered that Hoshea had been operating treacherously behind his back having worked out a deal with King Saul of Egypt. And, adding insult to injury, Hoshea was way behind on his annual payments of tribute to Assyria. So the king of Assyria arrested him and threw him in prison, then proceeded to invade the entire country. He attacked Syria and threw up a siege against it. The siege lasted three years. Put your finger there. Siege. Have we talked about a siege? We understand what a siege is. Now, by the way, about two or three weeks ago, we talked about a siege of Samaria. And just to clarify, this is about 150 years later. So this is not that siege where the four lepers woke up in the middle of the night and said, what in the world are we doing here? You know, that's, this is a different siege now. All right, let's pick it up again. Verse 6. In the ninth year of Hoshea's reign, the king of Syria captured Samaria and took the people into exile in Assyria. He relocated them in Hala, in Gozan, along the... Haber River, and in the towns of the Medes. Medes, what's the Medes? That's a tribe that lived over in uh, the uh, Syrian area. You, you've heard of the law of the Medes and the Persians? This was an area around there. Verse 7, the exile came about because of sin. The children of Israel sinned against God, their God, who had delivered them from Egypt and the brutal opposition of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. Strangely enough, we just talked about that a while ago. About 1490 is when Moses took them out of Egypt. So that's a reference clear back to 1490. They took up with other gods. They fell in with the ways of the pagan nations God had chased off and went along with whatever uh, the kings did. They did all kinds of things on, on the sly, things offensive to their God. Then openly and shamelessly they built sex and religion shrines at every available site. Put your finger right there. Folks, you're going to hear some things today. It may shock you. you do, you're just probably going to be shocked because we're talking about God's chosen people here. But you need to know that we're talking about a God of love, but we're also talking about a people, his people, his chosen people that fell into some practices that you're going to find despicable. And so why did they do this? In, in verse 7, it starts us off. The exile was because of their sin. Uh, in the New King James, it literally says that they set up these shrines uh, in every available site right where we stopped. In the New King James, it says even under every green tree. I mean, they were all over the land, these sites to these various and sundry gods. Well, let's continue. They set up their sex and religion symbols at, at practically every crossroads. Everywhere you looked, there was smoke from pagan offerings to be to the various deities. The identical offering that had gotten the pagan nations off into exile. 
They had accumulated a long list of evil actions and God was fed up. You, here is a good place to say, uh-oh. God was fed up. He was fed up with their persistent worship of gods carved out of dead wood and shaped out of clay. Even though had God had plainly said, don't do this ever. Don't do this. Verse 13, God had taken a stand against Israel and Judah, speaking clearly through countless holy prophets and seers time and time again. We're going to learn more about that in a second. Turn away, this is God speaking there through prophets, turn away from your evil way of life. Do what I tell you uh, and have been telling you in the revelation that I gave your ancestors and of which I kept reminding you ever since through the servants and prophets. Verse 14. But they wouldn't listen. If anything, they were even more bullheaded than their stubborn ancestors, if that's possible. They were contemptuous of his instructions, the Solomon, the holy covenant that he made with his, their ancestors, and of his repeated reminders and warnings. Again, they lived a nothing life and became nothings. Just like the pagan peoples around them, they were well warned. God had said, don't do this, but they did it anyway. Verse 16, they threw out everything their God had told them and replaced them with two statue gods shaped like bull calves and then a phallic pole for the whore goddess Asherah. Uh, folks, if you want to see something, Google phallic pole. And strangely enough, there's still a lot of these things around in the, the Mideast that causes people, they still worship because uh, of this Asherah was a sex goddess and this phallic pole was something that will shock you, knowing especially that the children of Israel, our spiritual parents, had fallen into this. So they worshipped cosmic forces. You see where we are? They worshipped sky gods and goddesses. They probably looked at the stars, you know, and said, what's your sign? What's your sign? Huh? And they frequented the sex and religion shrines of Baal. They even sank so low as to offer their own sons and daughters as sacrificial burnt offerings. They indulged in every black arts of magic and sorcery. In short, they prostituted themselves to every kind of evil available to them. And God had had enough. Good place to say, uh-oh. Verse 18. God was so thoroughly angry that he got rid of them, got them out of the country for good until only one tribe was left, and that was Judah. The southern, actually, they weren't much better for Judah, also failed to keep God's commands, falling into the same way of life that Israel had adopted. God rejected everyone connected with Israel. That's the northern kingdom. And he made life hard for them and permitted everyone or anyone with a mind uh, to exploit them to do so. And then this was his final no. He threw them out of his sight. Folks, I'm putting my finger right there. Oh, God wouldn't do this. God is a God of love. God is a God of love. This morning about 7 o'clock, I got my finger right where we stopped. This morning about 7 o'clock, I was wandering around the house getting ready. And a word came to me, and I'll share it a little bit later, but does God run out of patience? Huh? When I read this, you know what I just read? God literally ran out of patience. So, question can God run out of patience? I think we can see, yes. Does he run out of love? No. As a parent, you know, we, Judy and I were parents, few kids. 
There were many, 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 many times with all those kids running around the house that we ran out of patience. And when those times came, we were still into swatting our kids on the behinds. And we did that many, many times. Did we ever run out of love? No. Does God run out of patience? Oh, God wouldn't do this. He's a God of love. He wouldn't do this. He wouldn't send anybody to hell. He's a God of love. Does God run out of patience? The answer is yes. We have just seen it. Verse 21. Back at that time, that God ripped Israel out of their places into the family of David. They made Jeroboam, son of Desbet the king. Jeroboam debauched Israel, turned them away. You're going to find out again. Jeroboam was their first king. So this started back with their first king. And he turned them away from serving God and led them into a life of total sin. The children of Israel went along with all the sins that Jeroboam did. They never murmured so much as a word of protest. In the end, God spoke a final no to Israel, turned his back on them. He had given them fair warning and plenty of time through the preaching of all of his servants and prophets. Then he exiled Israel from her land in Assyria, and that's where they are now. End of chapter 17. Folks, here is a Reader's Digest. Here is a Reader's Digest uh, list of the primary sins that we have just read about And we read them again in verses 14 to 17. But this is what you have just heard. This is the reason God ran out of patience with his chosen people. Number one, they completely abandoned, worshipped, and the law. If we were to say this today, they completely uh, abandoned worship and their emphasis on the word, the Bible. They adopted practices of foreign nations. I mean, they they allowed foreign nations to come in and influence everything. They they set up laws protecting these foreign nations coming in and establishing their own religions in their country. That's what they did. They established idol worship on every high hill. Asherah worship, that's that sex goddess. The perverse practice in idol worship. Astrological worship. They put a lot of emphasis on the stars and the moon. As I said a while ago, what's your sign? What's your sign? What were you born under, etc.? They even fell into child sacrifice. Is that hard to believe? That is hard to believe. They indulged in the black arts and sorcery. They caved into the woke culture of their day. Everything around them. Well... Hmm, did God run out of patience? He did. So, how long did this go on? Well, you have this, but let me, let me just show you something here, kind of interesting. See this chart? This chart, this chart has been one that I forgot my pointer, so I, I wanted to show you something. The guy that we're talking about in 17... The guy that we're talking about, let's see, what was his name again? His name was, his name was Ahaz. Oh, Hoshea. All right, look at here. See him right here? That's Hoshea. This happened 32 to 12. He reigned for eight years. It also said that he was reigning during the time of where is Ahaz 12. Where is he? 12. 12. No, no, there he is, Ahaz. So the, this, this is the southern kingdom, and here's old Ahaz, 732 to 716. Here's Hosea, 732 to 712. So you can see what was going on in the southern kingdom over here, and this is the northern kingdom. There were 19 kings in the uh, northern kingdom, and look at here. Look there, you see that? So, do we blame God for...
for running out of patience? Huh? I would think not. Do you know that if you start up there, Jeroboam, you, see, you remember he said a while ago, this all started with Jeroboam. You remember us reading that? So Jeroboam started at 931. Here we are in 732. I, if, I, if I add that up correct, that's a little more than 200 years. 200 years. Every, every king was a bad king. God had said, I've had enough. That's exactly what he said. And so consequently, you see what happened to the northern kingdom. They fell in 722 to the Assyrian captivity, and they were hauled off as captive. Now we say that the children of Israel were in captivity for 70 years. I want you to look at this. That's partly true if you look over here with the southern kingdom. They were in captivity for about 70 years. But look how long they were in captivity. That's about, they didn't come out of captivity. They didn't come out of captivity until about 580 or 590. So they were in captivity for about 150 years. And this was the northern kingdom. So we read a lot about 70 years, and that's true. But this northern kingdom was in captivity for about 150 years. So, and we read about all of their sins. Do you... Do you honestly, do you honestly, or would you honestly blame God for running out of patience? Huh? Well, I didn't think so. But you needed to know, since Jeroboam started up there at the top in 931, this was written, this was written about King Hoshea in 732. 200 years, all of this mess that we've been reading about. And gang, I'm telling you, this was not just the fact that they didn't go to church on Sunday. This was their practices. This is what they were doing. And God said, I've had it. That's enough. Did God run out of love? We know the end of the story, don't we? We know that God redeemed them later. You know that setting where you are. But there comes a time where God says, I've run out of patience. And so consequently, you need to know what led up to the captivity of God's people. Let's go back to our handout. In verse 18, we read, The Lord became angry with Israel and removed them from his sight. Look at the expanded version right below from the message. So God was so thoroughly angry that he got rid of them. Got them out of the country for good until only one tribe was left, and that was Judah. And we know what he did there. Next verse down, God rejected anyone connected with Israel, made life hard for them, and permitted anyone with a mind to do so to exploit them. And then his final the final answer was no, and he threw them out of his sight. Yang, as I'm reading, that's one of the most shocking verses I think I've ever, I've ever seen. God said, I just can't stand looking at you anymore. He threw them out of his sight. As I'm looking at this, I think you know where we're going. Where are we as a country? Where are we as a country as we compare ourselves to God's chosen people? You have to remember, we're talking about God's chosen people. These, this is not a bunch of wild-eyed Indians living out in the desert. This is God's chosen people. And so consequently... I got to looking at this week, and that's the reason I said, my lands. This, this is something. Uh, there, there are so many things that I see going on in our, and, and, and I don't want to be a pessimist today, but folks, I think we're in trouble. I, I just think we're in trouble. Uh, there comes a time, and 
as an old history buff, you need to know this from an old history buff. There comes a time where you hit, you, you reach the top of the hill, and all of a sudden you, you get on top of the hill and you start down. And I'll guarantee you, when you start down, it's a slippery slope all the way down to the bottom. History tells us that the average life of any nation is between 250 and about 300 years. We're fast approaching that. Well, that's kind of a somber, somber thought. Then I ask myself, what can we do? What can we do? Huh? We just say, well, oh, well. We, we just throw up our hands and say, well, well, that's the way it is. Folks, we got grandkids. We got, you know, my, my wife and I, we're into great-grandkids these days. And our great-grandkids, man, we love them. We love them. They haven't given us a bit of trouble. And, but I get to thinking, what kind of world are our great-grandkids going to be living in for crying out loud? And sad to say, if we, if we look at history, if we look at history, which we're looking at today out of 2 Kings, if we're looking at history, this is what we're, it's, it's telling us. We're kind of on a slippery slope on the head of downhill. So what can we do? And this is what... I've come up with, perhaps you, you can come up with some more. We need to strengthen ourselves in the power of the word and obedience to the Holy Spirit. Folks, if there's anything, we've got to get the word locked into our heads and our hearts. You know, I guarantee you we can read, we can read Ann Landers and we can watch Dr. Phil from now till the cows come home, but there's not any power there. Our only hope our only hope is right there in the Word. So we've really got to start paying attention to the Word. We need to pray. Sharon, prayer ministry of on-call ministry. Boy, that thing needs to ratchet right up to prayer. The prayer, and you know, I confess something to you. Um, it's difficult for me daily to really get engaged in prayer. I really have to stop. I got so much stuff rolling around in my head. I don't know about you all, but every time I, I sit down and I start a time of prayer, you know, Satan just seems to throw everything in the world into my head and my heart. Prayer is hard. It may be easy for you, but boy, it's hard for me. But I can't give up. We cannot give up. We must pray. Here's something I thought about. We got to get some backbone for crying out loud. We become so conscious about this, uh, oh, not not uh, offending anybody. We we become so conscious about not wanting to offend anybody. Like you remember one of the things: if we don't stand for something, we'll fall for anything. That's us. We have absolutely become, and folks, I, I guess in reading this and studying this for the last couple of weeks, I think one of the things, we just have to get some backbone. We just have to stand up and say, that is not right. That is not right. Get some backbone. Take courage. Take courage. And then this last one. Judy and I have really become conscious of this. We've got to start speaking directly to our family. I want my kids to be protected against some of this stuff. I want my grandkids to be protected against some of this stuff. And it's coming. Uh, I don't know what woke <coughs> means. I don't know what it means, but I know what it looks like. I don't know who came up with that term, but I sure know what it looks like. We become we become a nation that we're, we're afraid that we're going to insult somebody. And so we don't do anything. We just keep our mouths shut. We just kind of go, we don't want to make any, we don't want to make any waves. Folks, we're going to have to get a backbone here or we're going down the tubes. And so consequently, in reading this passage, even more so than anything that I have read or studied recently, this jumped out at me. We've got to get some backbone and to stand on the principles of the word and speaking to our family families now is more important than ever because 
I don't know about you all. I'm, you know, I'm looking toward the finish line. If I've got eight to ten years left, you know, I'll be blessed. Most of us in this room, if we've got, well, a lot of you are much younger. Marty. But I mean, you, you, we got to face it. We're looking, we're looking straight ahead at the finish line, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be a fatalist. I'm just telling you the truth. Just telling you the truth. So I guess in studying this, this past couple of weeks, I just really hope that we as a class take serious about what's going on in our world today. Even in our, in our church, you know. What are we going to do when we, when we look about Jesus being baptized? Was he going to be baptized by John the in, independent denominationalist? You know, we've gotten to a place where even the name Baptist is offensive to a lot of people. They think we're rednecks. So let's get rid of the word Baptist. That's the first time I've said anything about our situation. But I don't back up from that. I'm taking backbone when I say it. All right? You need to understand that. You need to understand that. So, folks, I don't know where we go with this other than the fact that, to me, it was a wake-up call. Because I saw us. I saw me. I saw me all over this stuff. You know, would I fall into a trap? Would I fall into a trap of worshiping the stars? But no. But even my sister and I, my sister and I have the same birthday. We were born on February the 11th. I was born on her 13th birthday, talking to her yesterday. She's 95 years old. And she said, well, little brother, said, you know, we Aquarians, we Aquarians, are strong and tough. We live long lives. She's 95, just tough as a boot. And it hit me again. You know, we don't make a big deal out of it, but one of the first things she and I talked about was the fact that we're Aquarians. Where in the world did that come from? Huh? I know where it came and I just kind of, I just kind of swallowed it and kind of gone along with everybody else. Have you? What's your sign? And so, lo and behold, I look at a lot of this stuff that fell, fell at the feet of the northern kingdom, Israel, and the southern kingdom, Judah. And here they are, and I'm looking at this stuff. Child sacrifice. You know what that is in today. That's abortion, for crying out loud. And here we are battling this stuff again. So, folks, I don't know how to end this other than the fact that I just say, we gotta, we got to wake up. Just got to wake up. Okay?